Welcome to chapter 13. Uh, this is the chapter where we start getting to talk about distribution in terms of demand, capacity. So as a services marketer, one of the things that you'll come across is a fair amount of the adaptation of economic theory. And in this chapter, that's a lot of options here to break out the supply and demand curves, talk about the elasticity, start breaking out some of the maths and some of the economics. My personal preference is to get you to read those sections of a chapter. So in 13, the video is going to talk about some of the principles and the practices and the ideas. The slides will have a little more in the way of a few more diagrams and the chapter itself has the depth and detail because when it comes to teaching something like a managing demand and services, formulas and equations are best encountered over time repeatedly with re recourse to printed material. So what we're going to talk about in this block is how to think about using demand and capacity as a services marketer. And in that, one of the elements that you really want to be considering is services marketing is, because of its nature, going to need producer and consumer to be co-located. That puts an initial constraint on the nature of the service. So the services need to work out, do they move to the consumer or the consumer to them? The lack of inventory means we can't stockpile for busy periods, but we can queue customers. So if we're going to put customers in queue, effectively we are stockpiling clients rather than stockpiling produced materials. How do we use that queue to our best advantage? And how do we readjust, how do we reset demand periods so that we're getting the most use out of our facilities? This is one of the other factors about services marketing is the facility constraints. There are only 100 seats at a restaurant, so how do we get more than 200 people through? Not just in terms of two different sittings, so a booking for 6 p.m. and a booking for 9 p.m., or a booking for 6, 7, 30, and 9. How do we make use of these factors? So the demand capacity match has the economic side. Low utilization and overutilization have their own problems. If we think for a moment in terms of the interplay between distribution and integrated marketing communication. Excess capacity, low utilization can send a signal of poor quality. Now this is a challenging moment because low utilization, high price, low utilization would normally be exclusivity. So you would be pitching it as this is a, such an exclusive club, it doesn't even have members. But exclusivity in branding is going to be challenging because low utilization will be seen as it's got to be something wrong. Why are there always empty tables? In the middle, the ideal use, the balance between demand and supply, some degree of uh, if you exceed capacity and there are always optimal capacities. So this is why growth is not always good in services. Now this is why you also want to be very careful in terms of managing expectation. For example, when a service, which traditionally deals with say 200 people in a day, gets a positive review in media and suddenly has 500 people queued, the demand has been ex will exceed the capacity to deliver. Now, if the high quality, the nature of the high quality service was, we could afford individual personalized services because we only dealt with 15 people. Word got out, this was great, this is amazing, some of the best experiences of my life. 
At 30 people, you can no longer do individualized. And at 45 people, you are starting to need to do generic. And at 60 people, you just can't get that many people through the door in a day. You are losing your brand. You are losing your service promise. So what you're trying to do in a lot of services marketing is make explicit when the capacity is getting put to a premium and to make explicit capacity promises. One of the things you could do, for example, in a services marketing uh, operation, so say a hairdressing salon, is you could offer a time period where you know you've got low capacity, and you know there's only going to be one or two people in the salon. You could offer certain services to only be available at that time. So you know that the faster, quicker throughput services can be put on, say it's 45 minutes versus for a haircut. You can put two of those effectively in a two hour period. So 90 minutes worth of staff time, 30 minutes worth of preparation and downtime. You could increase that to be uh, throwing another service on top of it and you know you've got down periods so make it an hour's length and charge it a premium but say there will be an exclusive you know privacy or a private club there'll only be four bookings available in that time it looks like it you have excess capacity but if you've communicated that this is a limited the salon to yourself for 45 minutes type of arrangement then that low utilization becomes a feature the other aspect when you've got high demand is shifting delivery platforms. And this is one of the things you'll see with uh, food and beverage retail and the coffee service industry, shifting peak demand to takeaway. That you order, and in peak periods, if you haven't booked the table, you can order, you can get the coffee, but it will be in a takeaway format. So you are going saying, we are over capacity, we cannot store you as people in this venue, but you can take our experience away with you. That brings demand and supply back to promise and also to product creation. So when you've got excess demand and you're going to have to turn customers away, and you've got the customers that you've got, they'll be crowding or overtaxed staff. What you need to do is to find a way to either minimize excess demand in future, for example, bookings. A restaurant in Brisbane that I went to, I think, three nights in a row attempting to buy, they were a particularly good set of ribs. First night, second night. On the second night, they took my contact details and said, look, we're going to reserve this for you and we'll call you when it's ready tomorrow. If you still want to, you're really keen to get this product, we will take a booking. We will reserve you as a customer. So we will call you when our product is ready for you to pick up. So demand shifting and demand remanagement. The excess demand where you have to turn staff customers away also gives you the opportunity to do things like capture details, to take bookings for another night of the week, to take bookings for later in the night. So, to, but to be able to do that, start with you need to have empowered staff. And secondly, you need to be able to actually handle a booking management scheme. Also, if you promise that you're going to call someone back if the table becomes available, you need to call them. And you need to actually go through on those promises. The demand exceeding optimum capacity, everyone gets served, but the quality is not as good as it could be. This is where some management of expectation and also communication. If you were to say to a customer, look, it's quite busy tonight, it's going to be a longer lead time or it might take a little longer for your order. Have you been here before? You know, have you experienced our service before? If you, yeah. You know, and at the end when they're getting, you know, the payments are being done, say, look, we, if you can offer them the opportunity to come to a lower peak time, say, look, yeah, it's a busy night tonight. It's quite often busy on, say, Tuesday night. Thursdays are a little bit quieter if you want to have come back in um, and experience the service at a, little, at a more leisurely pace. 
So communicate downtimes, communicate gaps in uh, resource use as a sales feature. Now the, the perfect element is uh, optimum capacity. Staff and facilities are at the ideal level. There's no downtime, you are breaking even to profit and you're getting a quality set of goods out there. This is what we're aiming for, this is what we rarely achieve because optimum is just that. Adequate is somewhere around this, where you're just slightly over, you're just slightly under. Excess capacity, as I've raised this couple of points already in the presentation. Excess capacity can be on sold. At the same time, if you are selling customers, if you are in a lecture theatre and it's just you and the lecturer, you can have the most customised one-on-one, two-hour consultation period of your academic career, or you could be sitting there awkwardly going, wow, I can't even leave early to go make my other class because that will be embarrassing. So, Excess capacity can be turned around, it can be given over as a, well, whilst there's very few other customers here, would you be interested in trying one of our new products that we're prototyping? Or whilst we've got the opportunity to talk to you, like these are some of the things we want to do with the, our service, would you be interested, yeah, whilst we will modify your bill slightly or you know, give you a, slightly, a couple of extra products, but we want to have a chance to, you know, the manager wouldn't mind having a chat to you if that's okay, you know, since it's kind of quiet at the moment, it's a good chance for us to really you know, get to know you. There are ways to use excess capacity, but your challenge is if customers are being sold other customers, a drop off in capacity is, can quite often cascade really quickly that people don't go back to an empty venue because it didn't have the vibe that they were looking for. And if all the people who didn't go back all went back, because you know, there was no vibe, there was no atmosphere, it would have the atmosphere. All right, what are we looking at when we're talking about capacity constraints and demand patterns here? Constraints, time is the biggest constraint. Labor. Do you have the skilled staff to be able to, and how many hours of staff time do you have? That includes operational issues such as pack down, uh, setup times, and staff fatigue, staff recovery time. Equipment and facilities, Do you, how is your venue set out? What's your service escape environment? What are the actual capacity loads? For example, the lecture theatres on the ANU campus if we've got a 60 seat lecture theatre and it's booked for two hours, we can't go back and pick up an empty theatre from half an hour ago, or we can't put more than 60 students into that theatre. Also, on a lecture, something like a lecture theatre, if there's a, it's got seating for 300, is it optimal at 300, or is there an optimization around 250? where there's still some space to move. There's still the opportunity for the people who need to leave early to be close to the edge of the row so they can get out. What are the, uh, what's the optimal consumption of a venue versus its maximum consumption? In terms of the demand patterns, look, there's a lot of work on demand. Again, this is where we get to a bunch of the economics. One of the things you want to be able to do as a services marketer is you want to be using internal market research. You want to be thinking about the data you're collecting and the data you're collecting by existing and operating. So you should be able to, over time, start recognizing demand patterns. A new service starting up can look at, in its first year, it'll be a bit of trial and error. But reasonably quickly, you should start detecting patterns. For example, we know that we have peak demand traffic periods. So if you're going to be a delivery service, and you know that between 5 and 7, it's gridlock, then you don't want to be offering speed of delivery during that window if you know that there are predictable cycles of traffic barriers and traffic problems each day. 
The random demand fluctuations, look, there's a certain level of design you can put into your service to handle excess unexpected capacity. But for the most part, this is what we refer to as catastrophic success, where you have been so successful that the demand greatly strips what you are capable of delivering. Lastly, uh, demand pattern by market segment. Look, this is an area where it's all about the marketing. Segmentation and demand pattern based on market segments is one of the areas where if you can, if you're interested in this, you're good with numbers or you're good with pattern recognition, there's a lot of work to be done commercially and academically in terms of mapping segment demand and then trying to build these segment profiles so you can work out of your clientele, of a target market, when are they most likely to want to use a service and can we then modify the service to best meet this market. For example, one of the uh, elements, physiotherapy and massage, has a high level of Monday morning to Monday afternoon minor sports injuries. It's a common day to treat what are uh, referred to as the weekend warriors. The people who play sport once a week, they play sport on a Saturday or a Sunday. On the Monday, they are stiff and sore, or they've done an done a hamstring, twisted an ankle, whatever they've done, and it's a known, at this time, this cohort of people will be wanting to come in for minor repairs. So knowing that this pattern exists, it's possible then that if you're getting a peak demand period here, to open up, say, a Sunday night, a Sunday night service of, welcome to the working week, we'll patch you up before you go back on Monday, if you knew that this demand segment was consistent, constant, you would then be able to start either developing new patterns around it or knowing what services and which team to have on Monday morning versus, say, the Monday morning crew of uh, shoulders, wrists and elbows, have your specialist team on there, knowing that then later in the week it moved towards people who were dealing with other injuries or other problems, so you knew which staff who were better at certain service provision to put on against the market segments and against the use demand, against the demand people would have for certain skill sets. All right, so let's look. The last thing we're going to look at in terms of uh, demand here, we've got two sets of uh, ways of examining uh, adjusting capacity and shifting demand. On screen are some of the details. The key here is that as a services marketer, how can we make a demand shift a feature? For example, you know that you have non, you've got uh, trough periods, you've got low demand. How do you turn that into a desired and demanded or a premium? And that's one of the things you want to be thinking about here is it's not just about moving your standard. Can you also take a, an opportunity to create a product variation, a service variation, or a price variation that will make this particular uh, low demand cycle in your working week more valuable to a particular customer? So you've got two parts to this. One is you're trying to move and you can do this with honesty. You can turn around to your customers and say, "This is; these are our peak periods. You'll get a lower; there'll be a lower service or greater demand in these periods. These are the off-peak times. Come visit." Uh, if you've got a loyalty incentive scheme, you can go and offer non-peak incentives, or you can go and use the loyalty card as a streaming. So the loyalty card has its own queue, its own queuing protocol, its own entrance, versus the casual, who you know hasn't bought from you, or you know hasn't signed up to provide you with the information. <coughs> so you've got a way to streamline. But I think as a marketer, you want to be looking at your segments, looking at your capacities and going, in this downtime or in this low demand period, 
what audience would want to make use of this time? Or should I even be operating in this window? You may find that uh, on a Monday morning between 9 and 12, it's been very hard to get, server, get people into the service. Yet at the same time, you know that there's been peak, from talking to your clients, you know there's peak demand for Tuesday evening or Wednesday night or Thursday night. So you know, all right, we don't open till midday on a Monday, but we stay open late on a Wednesday. So you can actually move your capacity around as well, because you've got, where well, you've got blank spots, you can say, well, do we need to operate in that period? Can we open, can we shift those hours to somewhere else? And that's adjusting capacity. Now, these are two separate slides, but I don't want you to think of demand and capacity as two separate entities. Where the demand is too high and you're trying to reduce demand, you can also adjust for capacity. So the demand is greater than expectation. The standard thing here is to temporarily increase the capacity. Alternatively, it's to move capacity. Bring capacity in or have fallback scenarios. For example, if you were a you know, you're in Nando's restaurant, you know that the uh, your civic operation is very busy tonight. Star people coming in. If you were to contact the other two, you know, there's the Woden and the Belconnen, and say, what's the demand like up there? You could either bring, say, do an employee shift. They're right, we're going to need to borrow two of your staff, and whilst you're on the way down here, bring some supplies. Or try for a demand shift to say, we have an alternate venue open at this location. Our alternate venues are here, we can reserve a table. In fact, given it's 15 minute travel time, we can also put your order through to them so that when you get there, it'll be um, only a few minutes wait. So there are ways to make use of your, uh, if you've got networked and linked stores, there are ways to, and again, you're thinking about it from a brand and from a marketer's perspective. What value addition can you offer to move to modify capacity. What value addition happens when you modify capacity? The alternate um, elements, as I said, they, if you're modifying capacity to deal with low demand, scheduled downtime or training, scheduling uh, product development, it may be that the best time, you know you're gonna have low traffic on a Tuesday morning between, 12 and, uh, between 10 and 12, on Tuesday morning is always low traffic. That's the time to practice new services or try new services. The two or three customers who do come in during that period can be given a discount and told, look, this is a training. Yeah, 10 to 12 training time. If you can help us with this, we'll give you a discount. So you can modify uh, the behavior. And lastly is in demand management, one of the things you want to be looking at is do we need to go closer to the customer? Are we a great service, but we're hard to access? Is you know, We might have a great service, but parking isn't available until after 5, and we close at 4.30. So you've got to look at these factors of what is your standard distribution channel? What are your standard distribution issues of a retail or a shop front? Okay, the last two things we want to talk about. We want to talk about weight line strategy. Read over this one because there's a lot of work being done on it. Uh, what you want to be doing, there's a couple of pr principles in weight line strategy. And these really boil down to fairness and equity. In equity, you want it to be very clear that if there's a differentiation between customers who are waiting, those with the greatest need are being given the first priority. For example, if you're designing a waiting strategy for a hospital, an emergency ward in a hospital, what you want to establish is almost a color-coded priority area so that the people who are being seen to first, it's very clear that they are in critical and dire. So in fact, as was uh, once told to me by someone who worked at a, a ward, 
one of the things that they try and communicate to the people who are waiting is if you've just if you're still here you're in better condition than you thought if you've just been rushed through well then you've got the problem and you're the priority because you've got the worst end of the deal so trying to communicate this a longer waiting time is a sign of better conditions and that's the equity side the fairness side is a sense that the lines move with purpose if you've gone into a bank you've picked up your little paper number and the number says 103 you get in there you look at the board and the board says 101 you think right I'm two people away and then the next 12 numbers to come off the board start with a number other than one like 507 508 509 602 603 there's no fairness perceived fairness and there's no perceived equity because when you looked at that scorecard and you looked at that next customer you had reasons to believe that you were only a couple of customers away from the queue so you need there to be a real communication as to how prioritizing will take place where you sit and what a reasonable duration time should be of course the trick that we've put into this is designing waiting so that waiting becomes part of the service there are ways and means uh, one of the facets to this in one of the ultimate queuing hoarding waiting periods is to be stuck at an airport and a lot of work's gone into the service scape design of the airbridge the air side as opposed to the uh, arrival side to have ways for you to use up time and ways for you to consume the downtime doing something makes you feel uh, that there is basically occupied time beats unoccupied time I can honestly say if you could avoid just using television as your default make give things because daytime TV is thoroughly depressing and a doctor's surgery that is full of ads for life insurance health insurance and funeral insurance is not a friendly happy place unfair and said unfairness equity these are issues but the other facet that you can put into play here is weight management where and we do this with restaurants and we're doing this increasingly with the uh, we've got a food court and food delivery those pages or buzzers that will go off to let you know that your service your food is available using those in service industry environments uh, there's a doctor's surgery that will hand you that you can either register for an SMS which will give you the five minute warning of the last patient has just exited please return to uh, the patient's wrap, you know, they're wrapping up the consult please return to the lobby to uh, be available knowing that they can be summoned back in patients will uh, go and use their time so even though it's uncertain even though it's open-ended knowing that they will be recalled when it becomes closer they will see it as a finite wait so if they're told okay you'll get an SMS when you're five minutes out from going to the surgery that will feel to them as a five minute wait time because the other time is being spent doing things so really think about waiting as a factor that you can build into a service design. It should show up on your service blueprints as a touch point. If there's a queuing or a waiting, what can you do to occupy people's time? And what can you do to occupy people's time that would expedite the service? For example, if you are, and the last point on this is, if you're going to, as part of your service, require customization. People filling out forms in advance of going into their appointment people filling out background information or getting the uh, materials together gathering their materials together so you're going off to see a, a doctor you get the background survey so the doctor can speed up so you go from well why are you here to I'll just, you know you've looked at the form right now I know where I can start asking my questions a faster lead time, a faster build time into the service, knowing that there's wait periods that you can use 
to modify the service encounter or start presetting the customizations does make it for a better uh, service experience. This is one of the bigger areas conceptually to deal with and is one of the more interesting areas where there's a lot of work that this is where I emphasize this idea of think like a marketer. What can we do as marketers knowing what we know about consumer behavior, communication, service design, product design, what can we do to build features around areas that would otherwise be seen as problems? As always, if you need me on the email or across Twitter, this particular chapter is one of these ones where this is the highlights package. I really want to emphasize you're really well served by going through the textbook and having a good look at what uh, the equations and the predictive models and looking at the literature around this. Demand and capacity management are areas that if you can master this, you have not only a benefit for your own services, but it's one of those things that you can go and actually farm out as a consultancy. For those of you looking to spin off your studies into a profitable area, being able to help with yield management and demand management is a skill set that is saleable in the marketplace.